I'll read for you just a quick couple of verses from Matthew 24. Now, I've heard an argument from some people who've, uh, you know, criticized after the tribulation and basically want to teach a pre-tribulation rapture. And they'll often ask about, well, you know, what about the re-blossoming of the fig tree in Matthew 24? What do you say about that, Pastor Anderson? And it's one of these just mythological, made-up things. That's why whenever anybody wants to discuss anything about the Bible with you, always have the Bible in front of you. Look down at uh, verse 32, what the Bible says about the fig tree here. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Now you can see here that this mention of the fig tree has nothing to do with any re-blossoming of any fig tree. It just mentions the fact that when a fig tree has leaves on it, you know it's almost summer. And when you see the events of the tribulation, you know that the second coming of Christ is nigh. Go back to chapter 21. I want to preach a sermon quickly here called The Cursed Fig Tree. The Cursed Fig Tree. You want to talk about the re-blossoming of the fig tree? Uh, it's not biblical. Look at verse 17 in Matthew 21. And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. And said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Now it's interesting because right after Jesus curses this fig tree and says that fruit will never grow on it ever again because it did not produce fruit when he wanted it to produce fruit. Okay, and by the way, this is the springtime. You know, and I don't have time to go into it, but if you look at the Feast of the Lord, the spring feasts represent the first coming of Christ. <coughs> the fall feasts represent the second coming of Christ. And so here in the spring feast, representing the first coming of Christ, he shows up, he expects to find fruit on that fig tree. It isn't there. He curses that fig tree and says it's never going to bring forth fruit again. Now, right after this, he gives a series of three parables that all teach the same lesson about the fact that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to have to take the kingdom of God away from Israel and bring it to another nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Look at one of them in verse 33 of chapter 21. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and left it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the what? The fruit. He's looking for the fruit. Drew near. He sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first. And they did unto them likewise. And of course, we know these are the prophets that he sent to them throughout the Old Testament. And then it says, but last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Verse 43, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Question, where in this teaching of Jesus Christ does he say, but then he's going to come back and, and then the fig tree is going to blossom again and bring forth fruit once again. Is that what we see? Where does he say, oh, but then... After he's done miserably destroying the husbandmen, he's going he's gonna to bring them back and say, okay, guys, let's dust you off and, and you guys are going to serve me again and you guys are going to bring forth fruit again. They're done. Right. They're gone. It's over. It's too late. He said they're miserably destroyed. He said the tree is withered. It's dried up. It's dead. He said it's never going to produce fruit forever. And yet we have this false teaching out there which at the core of dispensationalism, at the core of Zionism, at the core of the pre-tribulation <coughs> rapture, that says, oh, God's not through with the physical nation of Israel. He's going to come back to dealing with them. He's going to give the kingdom of God to them once again. No, the kingdom of God is taken from them, given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof permanently. Go through it to Luke 13. And we'll find another scripture about the cursed fig tree. Luke 13. The Bible reads in uh, Luke 13, beginning of verse 6, He spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Sound familiar? 
Then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. You see here a fig tree that is given one last chance to produce. <coughs> Just like the nation of Israel, he sent prophets, he sent other prophets, he sent other prophets in three waves, and then at the end, he says, okay, last of all, I'm sending my son. They'll reverence my son. Here he says, hey, one last year to produce. One last chance to produce, and he says, if it bear fruit, well, great. Verse 9. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. And let me tell you something, it's exactly what John the Baptist said when he said, Think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the tree. Right. Talking about the children of Abraham. And he said, And every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Awesome. He said, Look, it's over for you. Don't tell me Abraham's your father. You're of your father the devil. You didn't bring forth fruit. I've given you every chance. I've sent my son. This is your last chance. You're going to wither away. You're going to be cut down. You're never going to bring forth fruit. Forever. It's over. And yet, they say, he's not through with them yet. <laughs> but you know what? They have to resort to the Old Testament. They can't show you any scripture from the New Testament that will tell you that. It's always we have to go back to the Old Testament. Why? Because they have to take verses out of context yeah. from the Old Covenant that is no longer in force. It's right. over. Yeah. They continued not in that covenant. He said, I regarded them not, saith the Lord. <coughs> he made a new covenant. And that new covenant, you say, well, does the new covenant exclude Israel? The new covenant includes anyone who believes on the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ Amen. on an equal footing where there's no Jew nor Gentile. That's right, yes. And so they have a lot of elaborate theology. They make a lot of arguments. They quote a lot of Old Testament, failing to rightly divide and understand that the Old Covenant is no longer in force. But when we see the teachings of Christ and the teachings of the New Testament, the teachings of the epistles, it's very clear. Galatians 4 sums it up when he says, look, the Old Testament covenant is like Hagar. And the New Testament covenant is like Isaac. And the children of Abraham physically that are not saved are like Ishmael. We are the children of promise as believers in Christ, whether we be Jew or Gentile. And he made it clear. He said, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. The son of the bondwoman shall not inherit with the son of the free. Let me tell you something. The millennial reign of Christ on this earth is not going to be a hybrid kingdom of, of the saved and then the physical nation of Israel. No. The children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Many shall come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of all nations. Uh, it's only the believers of all nations. God is done with the physical nation of Israel. And the only Israelites that he has anything to do with now are the ones who believe in Christ. Has he cast away his people? God forbid. There's a remnant according to the election of grace. The ones who believe it by grace through faith. They're part of the body. But the fig tree is cursed. It will not re-blossom. The re-blossoming of <coughs> the fig tree took place in 1948. That shows us that right No, no, no. It's a cursed fig tree. It's withered away. And you know what? I guarantee you that fig tree's been cut down. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. Help us not to be deceived uh, by the Zionist dispensational doctrine. Help us to realize that the, the children of Israel have blown it and that uh, the kingdom of God has already been taken from them permanently. And help us to understand we are the chosen people. We are the chosen generation. We are the holy nation. We are the royal priesthood. And uh, help us to uh, walk worthy of that calling in Jesus' name.